Hey everyone, this is the ESOP Guy. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are on a journey to an ESOP. <clears throat> One of the things I was talking about earlier, a few podcast episodes ago, was my birthday. I had a birthday and I asked for what I wanted to get for my birthday was one of those one wheels because we live at the beach and I always see these people cruising down the beach with their one wheels and I was like, wow, that would be really cool. So anyway, happy birthday to me. I got one from my wife and it was really cool. Um, I haven't totally wiped out yet. Um, I did wipe out a little bit, but um, <clears throat> so I've got that and it's really a lot of fun. And that made me start thinking about because those things are kind of expensive about cost. And so today we're going to get into a little bit of ESOP cost 101. Um, I appreciate you guys being in this journey with me. And it's been, like I said, a lot of, um, a lot of fun. We've covered a lot of ground today. Um, for those that are new to the podcast, I just want to say welcome to the podcast. And if you have an interest really in any of the other episodes, <clears throat> You can go to our website at journeytoanesop.com. And uh, really what I like about this podcast is that you can go in and look at specific topics that you might want to have more of an interest in, maybe um, just learning more about transa- ESOP transaction or how um, the warrants work or how a, a SAR would work. A lot of those are, have been specifically outlined so that you are equipped with information so that you can really continue on your journey to an ESOP. So Thank you again for 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 checking us out today. And so <clears throat> if you are contemplating an exit plan or a succession plan or thinking about, you know, how that might work with an employee stock ownership plan, you are definitely in the right place. So check this out. Michael and Sam have just moved to Santa Carla, California. They're about to discover its secret. Notice anything unusual about Santa Carla yet? No. It's a pretty cool place. If you're a Martian. Or a vampire. Sammy, help me! Stay back! Stay back! What's happening, Star? Get yourself a good, sharp stick. Drive right inside. You're a vampire, Michael. My own brother, a damn blood-sucking vampire. Oh, you wait till Mom finds out, buddy. When a vampire buys it, it's never a pretty sight. Michael, they're coming! All right, I just had to play that. That's the whole trailer of The Lost Boys. <clears throat> so the title of this episode today is The Lost Boys. What does an ESOP cost? All right, so <clears throat> let me just start off with this as I start, as I finish the intro for this episode. Um, the Lost Boys is um, a movie all about vampires, and ultimately Michael, um, who we'll talk about in a second, pays the ultimate cost for um for basically falling into a, a bad group of kids. So anyway, um, <clears throat> trans- tra- transactionally speaking, what we want to talk about today really is the cost of an ESOP. And I'll just say this for for everybody that's listening. And this podcast is, let me just say this episode itself is so difficult. And I'm just throwing myself out there in this podcast too, by the way, because I think people don't want to talk about cost of ESOPs. Um, because there's there's a lot going on when it comes to that. <clears throat> and I would say that geographically, within regions, it's definitely going to matter in terms of, of where you are transacting. I think that the deal size um, and complexity is going to matter. So what I've, I've been waiting to do this episode because I think it's going to be, it's number one, it's one of the major questions I always get asked. And I think it's an, it's probably one of the most important questions you can ask. Of course, you want to, to make sure that whatever you're spending and whoever you're, you're, or however you're spending it, you want to make sure you're spending it with the right people. So that's, that's always going to be an important um, fact for anybody doing it. So, um, 
But what we want to do today is we want to cover the itemized, as much as we can, the itemized expenses of an ESOP transaction. So this is not after the transaction. This is just before and getting the transaction done. And as I said, I, I've been waiting and gathering data on this for some time. And it, I can say it's still not perfect. And it, I'm just going to say that, you know, of course, this can vary. And we're in 2021. We're also at the end of the year. And I'll tell you that matters too, because everybody's super busy and the busier professionals get the, you know, hey, the more they're expensive they can get as well. So um, definitely not going to be um, something that I would say has, this podcast has a, is, is really has the ability to give you some, some basic ideas of the cost. Um, but hopefully we cover enough information to where you can ask good questions of the people you're working with and not immediately sign up to something without doing some due diligence. So, so that's a little bit of a long winded intro, but I wanted to kind of say all those things that I think are important. Um, if you like what you hear, please subscribe, share it with a friend. I have not asked in a while, but I will say, please leave a review. If you think that might be helpful. I, I think that there is, um, you know, it's, it's kind of like, Sometimes this takes time to do a review. So um, if you think this episode or this podcast in general has been helpful to you, please leave a review. And as I said, the best place that people get this episode or these things anyways is from you referring it over to somebody else to think, saying, hey, you should probably check this out. <clears throat> All right. So this episode, this or this movie that we're talking about, The Lost Boys, now you might might know by now that I grew up in the 80s because this is totally an 80s movie. Um, it has a Halloween feel to it. So I wanted to make this seasonally atmospheric as well. So um, so you can kind of take that in and understand, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to connect our episode with really inf good information, but also, you know, also make it a little bit like, hey, what's happening right now? And we are in October and we're going to be... Um, October is interesting because we hit Halloween and then Thanksgiving and then Christmas and then the rest of the year is gone. And so it goes so fast. The movie, The Lost Boys, is <clears throat> really one of those, um, I wouldn't say it's the greatest movie in the world ever. Um, it's, at that time, it had some great music. Um, so the soundtrack is pretty good. It The storyline is, is vampire story. So it is um, this about these two kids that move and they're teenagers. They move to a town with their mom into a town called Santa Clara. And unfortunately the town is infested with vampires. And one of the lead vampires is Kiefer is played by Kiefer Sutherland. And um, they get Jason Patrick who plays this character, Michael in the, uh, in the story to hang out with them. So um, he's kind of hanging out with the wrong kids, but realize like they're really the wrong kids. Right. And the next thing, you know, he becomes a vampire. There's a lot of lessons here in this in this movie that I chose, and I would say poetically as a parallel to the world of Aesop's, because I believe, and this is putting myself out there a little bit, the Aesop world has its own vampires um, that are willing to take really more than what they really should. So listen carefully as we go through this podcast and see if you are dealing with a vampire or not, dot, dot, dot. What is one of the top questions um, that people say as we go through the process? So it's, um, hey, you know, not 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 just what does it cost, but um, how do how do the costs work is important. Like when you think about the cost of any stuff, understand this: you're not just going to go in and hey, here's my check, let me go to the closing. There's a whole bunch of stuff that happens between when you conceptualize the fact that you want to go and help your company by doing an ESOP to actually getting to the closing table and signing those documents and having everything be, you know, put together. And I want to start off with this because I think it's an, <clears throat> I think this is where some of the whole presentation of the truck of the structure and transaction of an ESOP gets, gets put together. And <clears throat> what I want to start with is, I'm very sorry, I got a, <clears throat> a little, uh, cold. I had a cold this week, and I'm getting better. I mean, I'm way better, much better than I was a couple of days ago. Okay, so um, I want to start off with what it looks like for from the perspective of when we call an uh, what we call an M and A deal. Uh, 
An M&A deal, M&A stands for merger and acquisition deal. And it typically is referred to a deal where you sell your company to a strategic buyer. Could be a private equity group, could be um, a venture capitalist, could be a competitor. But the M&A deal <clears throat> has very specific steps in order to uh, you know, go through the process. And so, so I want to go through that because I think the biggest thing with ESOPs and the cost of ESOPs is because they're often referred to as, hey, this is just like an M&A deal. And I'm going to, as we go through this, I'm going to talk a little bit about like, as we go through the M&A deal, then we're going to get into the ESOP transaction because I, I want to compare the two and understand that I think that that is used a little bit more, more from a deceptive realm than it should be because I, I disagree. I think an ESOP transaction, um, has to be an arm's length transaction. We know that from the Department of Labor, but it differs a lot from an M&A deal. <clears throat> so, but let's go through an M&A deal for a second. First off, when you want to sell your company, you're like, hey, I, I necessarily, maybe, maybe you already have a bunch of people calling you. You don't have to do this. But say some people don't have somebody calling them, or maybe they do have a lot of people calling them, and they need, they need an advisor. So they go, and hey, I want to hire an advisor. Now, typically, these advisors are going to be what we call investment bankers. And their job is to help you sell your company. Right now, very similar to that, that when we go through an ESOP deal, hey, what's your job as an advisor? It's to help them sell their company. Right. So on the very, very face of that, that definitely is the same thing. Now, what a, what an advisor, investment banker does in their process for a straight up M&A deal is that they they put together a pitch book and we call this also a confidential information memo for their client. Now, we also do this on ESOPs, Right. But it's different in the sense that they're going to go out to a marketplace. Now, investment bankers, one of the things that they bring to the table in value is, is a buyer group. They connect your business with a potential buyer group. So clearly and inherently, there's value there. The buyer group within the um, ESOP community is the trustee. And going to... Conference, ESOP conferences or working through, um, you know, the like, you know, attorney, ESOP attorneys, and everybody knows ESOP trustees. It's not like uh, an investment banker has these buyers or a strategic sale that nobody really knew who they were because they put it together. And so, see, there's going to be a fundamental difference here as we start thinking about the differences between the MA and an ESOP transaction. Now, <clears throat> On an M&A transaction, on behalf of the company, the advisor is going to gather as many offers as they can get for the client, okay? So if you're really doing a great job as an investment banker for your client and selling their business, and the business itself is very marketable, okay, maybe maybe those are two, two truths that have to be combined, they go out and they, hey, I got 10 offers on your company, let's take the top three, throw out the rest, then we do a best and final bid and everybody, you know, you just keep pumping that price up. What's happening, what's happening there is that the business itself has this certain market value, but the investment banking people are, are bringing at that value to the highest possible level. Um, it's like this, if I could, if I could sell my house this way, I would get all the buyers in New York in California to come and look at my house <clears throat> and walk through it maybe virtually and be like, Hey, I'm going to offer this. And then I say, no, I've got 15 other offers and all that. And so you get that you're going to get a bigger number, right? And that, and that's what investment bankers do for an M and A deal. So they go through and they help their client determine what's the best offer. So they'll advise them on that. <clears throat> and sometimes th that offer might be a huge multiple, but there's a big earnout. Maybe it's a lower multiple with less of an earnout. And so there's all these different options that you that you get into. Then they come in um, to you know they officially come in with a letter of intent that gets executed by the um, the seller and. That, of course, gets reviewed by an attorney and everybody else, of course, before you sign it. But primarily that legal that letter of intent is going to give the buyer who got selected this right of exclusivity, which just means, hey, the, the now the deal is off. It's there, We're now under contract and we're going to start our process of doing due diligence. 
And so um, as we go through that process of due diligence now, um, of course, the advisor is helping, but now you have a buy side team coming in, just similar as we go through the ESOP transaction. Now, again, the difference is that the investment banking firm for an ESOP transaction, instead of going out to a big strategic buyer group and, re- and increasing the price by doing that, they go to a, a trustee group and we interview the trustees, we select a trustee, but every trustee is bound by the Department of Labor to pay only the fair market value of the company. And so herein lies the factual difference between an M&A transaction and an ESOP transaction. The, the Department of Labor has issued a process agreement that the trustee is going to follow, not only including, hey, this is how we want you to hire your valuation firm. But this is the, this is how we want the transaction protocol to go so that you as the trustee don't pay more than fair market value for the company. On an M&A transaction, what's going on? They're going to pay more than, they, they, we want them to pay more than fair market value. And if you're going to sell your company to a strategic buyer and they're going to go in and, and take that company and maybe change it all around and do whatever they want with it. They can fire everybody they want. They can do whatever they want with it. It's their company. They're going to pay a big premium for that. But a financial buyer is paying a financial valuation and a financial fair market value. So, so when I when I say that, I think it's really important that you understand the difference that you're not getting an investment banking firm to come in and give you a highest bid trustee who's well, we put all the trustees together and they this is the one that's going to pay the most for it. Hey, that doesn't work that way. Um, if it does, let's just point out the the. Uh, point of caution to you as selling shareholder, guess what? The investment banking firm on an ESOP transaction doesn't have any liability. They have no liability from a fiduciary standpoint. They just put the deal together. And the more they get, the more they get you, the more they get paid. So um, is it possible that they're going to put together a deal where there's a trustee that they know that would pay higher multiple? Maybe. But what what I'm going to say to you is this. If you're doing an ESOP deal, um, the best thing that you can do in your mind is have an expectation of getting fair market value because that's what's right. Because the Department of Labor wants it that way, because the IRS wants it that way, because it, it's a retirement account, and it's it's that is what the number is. So if you want to sell your business at a strategic value, um, don't don't even consider an ESOP, to be honest with you. Do an M&A transaction and go through the whole process that we're going, we're talking about right now. Um, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. The problem I'm, I'm, I'm identifying here is that, um, I think the cost of an ESOP is radically high because it's, it's, because the idea behind an M&A transaction is being used in the process. And it makes people confused, to be honest with you. So working through the M&A, so then the, um, they select the best deal. They do the due diligence. Here they come, you know, with the, the buyer's group comes in with their big um, audit firm and they go through the due diligence and they, they look at every little nuance. Now that's true with um, an ESOP transaction for the most part. You're going to have, you're going to have this inspection period where people are looking at um, your books and records and they're asking questions. And there on that side from an ESOP transaction, what's happening is they are doing their job to help the trustee to determine what the business is really worth. There's a presentation that's going to happen where they come in and, and they go to the, the business and they ask the questions that they need to ask. Um, so all of this is very, very, I'd say parallel at this point. I'd say that in my experience with M&A transactions, um, the thoroughness of that is, is a lot, you know, more, a lot deeper and, um, as many things as they put on the LOI and the LOI process for an M&A deal is, should be very brief. Because a lot of the meat and the work is done through due diligence and then the documentation preparation. So, so we're going through the process of doing the M and A, um, and this and the seller selling. Okay, and he's like, okay, everything's going great. They get through the due diligence. Um, so then they start the pro- the process of actually doing the legal work. And so the legal work is going to include the 
um, buyer's counsel, and then you as the seller are going to have your counsel. And I would say you're also going to have your CPA firm, um, you know, from a tax planning standpoint. So very similar, um, except though there's probably going to be a lot more redlining an M&A document than there is in a ESOP transaction. There's going to be a little bit of that back and forth in an ESOP transaction, but there's there's a lot more going on with, a, with an M&A transaction only because there's a lot of reps and warranties, the different things that, that are a lot more serious in nature because the buyer is, or the seller is not going to typically stick around. And in an ESOP transaction, the seller is usually taking back a note. And so it's, it's, a, it's probably just a little bit simpler. So once the documents are completed and agreed upon, <clears throat> they're executed then by both parties and then the closing and the money is exchanged. Um, and then they either buy the assets or the stock. And in the case of an ESOP, of course, you're buying the stock of the company. So all of that, you know, as we, as we walk through it, the M&A transaction is, and is, it sounds complex, it's, and it sounds expensive, and it is, and it is, and that's what it takes to do it. Now, the invest, an investment banker is going to get paid in that transaction based on a percentage of the total. So at closing, um, whether you've got an earn out or not, whatever the number, the total number is, the investment maker is going to walk away with some percentage of the deal. And that's very customary. And I'm just going to say they absolutely earn every penny during a, a strategic sale of a company. They bring a buyer group in. They they um, it's the way that they presented the company. All of these things matter in in the end um, because they've got a buyer who can pay more than fair market value, and so they should get paid more for that. Um, when you get down to it, the selling shareholder is really um, paying not just for the help to go through the process, but to present the company in the best possible light um, and find the buyers, which are through the investment bankers network. Um, <clears throat> and so, you know, as long as you know that that's what you're getting into, um, that totally makes sense. In a, in, in a minute, in a, in a M&A transaction, there's a sense of what I would call success partners. Like your, your guys are partners. You're, you with the investment banking firm. It's like they're going to, you're going to win. They're going to win. Right. And, and that makes sense. Right. Because you've just, um, found the best market. You found, you found the best buyer in the marketplace. You know, maybe it was a needle in a haystack. I don't know, but you, you share in the rewards of that. Um, the cost, the other fixed costs or the cost of paying legal and tax advisors, um, these are going to definitely depend on the complexity of the transaction um, and the size of the deal. But generally speaking, um, those should be pretty straightforward in terms of that. So <clears throat> a lot of what we're talking about here is, is understanding that the selling, the selling advisor who's helping the client sell in an M&A transaction is doing a lot from a company standpoint. Some companies are more marketable than others. So there's certainly some work that has to be done with companies that are less marketable. Um, but they're doing a lot to earn their fee. Now, when we compare that to an ESOP deal, um, I was thinking about the scene in the movie Lost Boys where Kiefer Sutherland is, um, whose name is David in the movie. One of, he's one of the head vampires. He asked Jason Patrick to eat the, this rice. And, um, so Jason Patrick who's playing Michael. It's like, yeah, okay. Um, so he eats the rice and then he goes, Michael, hey, what are you eating? You're eating maggots. And then Michael looks down and is like, what? And maggots roll out of this Chinese box. And he's like, oh, gross. I told you, this is kind of like our Halloween edition. So anyway, um, so it's like that. I think when we make an ESOP transaction look too much like a real M&A deal, we're deceiving people into believing that is something is, um, we're, we're deceiving them into believing something that's not really true. And that's kind of where I think that's really the theme of this is from a cost standpoint, when people ask about the cost of the transaction, um, the bulk of the cost could be primarily in the investment banking side. And I, I'm firmly saying that I think for the most part, for most ESOP transactions, I don't think that that is necessary. And I think part of it is, is because there's not as many people doing transactions, um, the way that, that we do them. And so, and this is really not at all. Let me just say this very clearly. I'm not trying to like tell you how I'm doing what, what I'm doing. I'm using this to really help you understand the cost of a transaction and asking, hopefully asking the right questions. So as we go into this, let me, let me just stop and say, let me make a couple of assumptions. So you, um, so I can be completely clear. Um, first off, 
when we think about this, I am assuming that the transaction was we go through it and we go through the itemized costs is a leveraged ESOP transaction, which simply just means that a transaction trustee has to be hired to make an offer or to ve- or negotiate a purchase price. Then there's going to be debt related to that purchase price from senior debt and seller notes to pay for the actual cost. So that's the first assumption. Second assumption is, is that I'm giving, I'm kind of pointing out, I'm giving you my experience on transaction with act with, with ESOP transactions from an actual cost. And I'm comparing it with data that I've researched in the marketplace. So as I kind of said at the beginning of this whole thing, um, this is, this is, for me, a, a very important podcast because it's just a pull. I'm pulling together a lot of that research over the last couple of years, and I'm I'm trying to offer that as as resources to you to consider, knowing that um, there probably is a lot of variability to that. And you know, again, I think people just want a good idea of of things, how they cost or what they cost. So. The, so again, the purpose of this portion of the podcast is to uh, is to validate the ESOP deal and help to move from um, what you're what you're really looking to to understand better. Um, so when we start off with an ESOP transaction, you start off with, "Hey, I got the concept to the plan itself. I need I don't know if I necessarily even want to do an ESOP transaction yet." So the very first place that you're you're going to start is with some advisor that will help you determine whether or not the the process of going through an ESOP is even feasible. And that word feasibility gets thrown around a lot. A lot. And so is it a feasibility study? Is it a feasibility model? What's, it, what's all included in the feasibility? And ultimately, let me just say that I think the most important elements of a feasibility include, and I, and I would break this down into two pieces. This is the way I do it. But have to include, what is your company going to transact for? You know, what's the real valuation when you get down to it? The way that um, the trustee and their valuation firm are going to look at it. So that's going to be the first piece of information. The second piece of information is, is what does it look like from the company standpoint to buy and pay, buy the stock and pay the debt obligation? You know, if it's, if it's an S corp, what's the tax benefits of the S corp and how does that work from a cash flow standpoint? And then what does it look like for the seller? to sell that stock and what is it what's their cash impact as well the net cash impact after taxes and then thirdly really with the feasibility is what how does that really work with the IRS codes specifically 404 415 and 409p and is there is it a good fit with relative to the payroll of the company and is it a good fit <clears throat> relative to um, disqualified persons test and highly compensated people. So, so those are those are all going to be. And I'm not going to go into too much detail on that because it's just framing it out. Like that would be the first step, right? Now, I've heard people charging advisors charging to step into this. You know, something like fifty grand sometimes to do that first step. Um, you know, so I'm going to just basically tell you what I charge just so you people understand that, you know, the differences between the two. And, but I, I've heard it be, I've heard it be less than 50,000. So it's just, it really is, you know, it's just the first step. And I, and I'm going to tell you whatever the charges are there, if, even if it's free, Hey, we're just going to do this free analysis for you. No big deal. Um, what are the total costs, you know, when you get down to it? So let's just assume right now that though that's, we're in the first step of the ESOP plan. Um, what I would charge for that portion is um, based on the size of the transaction, somewhere around fifty five hundred to sixty five hundred for that first valuation model. And the, and I break the feasibility down into two pieces because if the valuation doesn't work, then the other stuff is not going to work either, right? So let's just get that out of the way. And then the next piece, if we do feasibility, would be something between fifty five hundred and sixty five hundred. And so based on those, based on that breakdown. Um, you're anywhere from eleven thousand to um, thirteen thousand dollars at the front end. So that's so that's the that's the very first step, and it builds all of those things I just talked about. So um, I think that some I've heard people do that for around the same amount, depending on on what region you're in and where you're doing business. Um, so so kind of just as we as we start throwing around itemized costs, um, one of the key questions that I would ask at this point 
is what is the obligation that you are making if say somebody said, hey, I'll do that first step and I won't charge you anything for it. We do ESOP deals all the time. We got, here's our big, you know, ESOP, um, you know, logo tombstone where this is all the transactions we did last year and all that. And, and they're valid. I mean, they're, they did the deal. So I'm not saying they're not. But <clears throat> ask the question, if you go forward with them, are you obligated to work with them throughout the whole process? And I think that's a really important question because costs are one thing. Say you can get it for free, but if you're obligated to do all of it with them, then I'm going to say, wow, okay, well, maybe you need to know what else they're going to charge you, right? So so after you understand if you have this obligation with them, then you need to also understand, obviously, what the costs are going to be with the rest of the of the transactions. So <clears throat> now this in their presentation sometimes doesn't get addressed up front, and this is your job to ask those questions. Um, so, going through that um, as we as we go, you know, through that whole process from you finish feasibility and you now you're working through all the different um, phases of an ESOP transaction. One of the next phases are, are going to be um, sourcing financing because. If you want to have a liquidity event on your ESOP deal, then you're going to want to have um, a bank to finance it. Um, I had done a, a podcast recently, um, and we were asking a little bit about some complexity with deals, like what makes it more complex. And one thing that can make a deal more complex is if you have a capital stack where you have more than one sources of fi- source of financing. So you have maybe a seller note, you have senior debt, maybe you have mezzanine financing. So organizing all that and sourcing all that can be um, can be pretty expensive. And so back to the investment bankers, what they're doing typically is they're going to take you know go find financing for the comp- for the transaction, and then they'll charge some type of percentage based on the financing they just got placed above and beyond the normal transaction fee that they're going to have to do the ESOP transaction. So this could make a transaction really expensive. And I think that it's a matter of, you know, I I don't have any specific cost to that because then we just have to kind of throw in um, deal size and then figure out how much they would charge for that. Um, I will just tell you that ask the question and, and find out, is it worth it? If you don't have a bank that will finance it and they're the only ones that will do it, then I guess that's your best choice. Um, the way I do my financing costs is I build it into the budget. So when I leave that first phase, um, which is the valuation and the feasibility, then the next part of it all becomes a budgeted deal. So I'll budget a cost for the rest of the deal, depending on the size of the transaction, if I'm going to help get the, the client financing but I don't take a percentage of the total fee. Um, I just have a fixed budget. So sometimes my whole fee would be say around 50,000 after I've, I've done the first two steps. And so as a comparative, I've just asked the question, like what would it cost them to get, get you financing? Um, how much, how much is that going to cost in terms of the total financing they're placing? Now, what I want to say about financing is this. Many businesses have, spent their whole business career negotiating the bank, negotiating with the bank to get a line of credit or negotiating with the bank to, to buy some real estate, right? Bank financing for an ESOP transaction <clears throat> isn't that much different. It's still underwriting. Then you're still working with the bank to determine the best terms, you know, and, and the key of it is, is to say, you know, okay, maybe I, maybe I or, or other investor or advisors, ESOP advisors have, some sources of financing that will help. And so maybe there's there's some specifics there that that have and bring value to you. But for the most part, the process of of asking for a term sheet, working through the trans working through financing terms is not foreign to most business owners. And that's why I think it's it's not like some um, mystical thing that happens and well some I got some lender to show up, you know, they're going to make an underwriting decision based on how they see the deal. And you're going to want to get more than one bank, obviously, to look at it just because you want to have some options. And now if you get into some higher level capital stack stuff, I mean, that's different when you're really going to have some real complex, you know, types of structures. But so I'm not speaking to that. I am speaking to the, to 
more of what I would say is the middle market type of ESOP deal that's out there. So, and I think that's the bulk of our audience anyway. So hopefully that's helpful. All right. So we're, um, we're going to now just break down these pieces and say, all right, if I, I take the sell side advisor off the table for a second, which I've been, that's all I've been talking about right now for so, so far. So we're, we're this far, we're this deep into the process. Now we're ready to hire a trust, a transaction trustee and their independent financial advisor and the attorney for our company to do the ESOP documents and an attorney to the trustee. Okay. So let me just give you on a normal deal that I've seen from a data standpoint, transaction trustees are going to range from $25,000 to $50,000. And on average, their independent financial advisors are going to range from say 15,000 on a low to $50,000. Attorney to the company is going to range from 30,000 to $65,000. An attorney to the trustee is going to range from 10 to $30,000. Now, again, they could be a little bit lower, a little bit higher than this, but this is just a good, what I think is a good range for people to think about. So if that lower range were true, we would have something around an $80,000 base of costs to do an ESOP transaction, okay? <clears throat> now, so what that means is, and that's the low range, so so please hear me now, we're in the middle of the end of the year and trustees are busy and everything, and that, those fees are gonna go up, Um but if it was $80,000 low and then you put, say, my fee on top of it, um, we're about, let's see, 80, 20, 140, 150 for a normal ESOP deal, $150,000. If you go on the higher range of all the numbers I just told you, 50 and, you know, then you're at about a 195 base fee. Plus, again, my fee would be, you're about 250 roughly. Um, in, in total fees. So now that's the way I structure it. Now, if you put an investment banker in the mix, that, that low $80,000 fee, you know, with, with all of those parties, plus the investment banking fee, you're going to be anywhere from a, another, you know, 300,000 to four or $500,000 because that that's the, that's the way they're structuring a transaction fee. Um, so you know, and this, and I, and I made a lot of notes before I made this, man, before I created this episode, because I want to make sure everybody understands this is not um, to do anything but to really understand that the cost of an ESOP definitely factually will vary. And it is much higher if you're going to use an investment banking firm and do it as an MA trans, like as a classical MA transaction. We're still going to have an arm's length transaction. You're still going to go through, once you've hired that team and you're going to have a budget, you're still going to go through all the steps of due diligence. You're going to go through all the steps of negotiating a term sheet with the, with the trustee and a counter offer. And those things go back and forth, doing plan design, creating the ESOP documents with a summary plan description, a trust document, um, um, an ESOP plan document, and all of the, all of the documentation to close the ESOP deal. So all of that is still the same in a normal ESOP transaction. It's just, as I pointed out, I think the differences between why it can be so costly um, in terms of, of making it more complex than it really needs to be as an M&A transaction or as a classical M&A transaction. So I really hope that helps. My advice at this, at the end here is build your budget during the phase of the trustee, trustee interview. So um, ask the questions about cost early on in the process before you hire your sell side advisor. Reevaluate what you're doing based on the decisions you've made um, relative to the ESOP deal. And, and go back to, to the principle here is this, that I believe is, is really true. You built your business, you created the value, and you absolutely can share that in a transaction with anybody you want as your advisor if you feel comfortable with them. So whatever you end up doing, it you know you make the decision. I just want you to make an educated business decision as you go through that process. So hopefully this helps you. Um, I don't think this will be my last ESOP episode po- or podcast episode on cost. Um, I think it's a very interesting topic. It's a very difficult one. So I hopefully um, I haven't made anybody mad out there, but at the same time, I think this is just what I've seen. Um, this is my opinion. Um, so, you know, hopefully that helps you. 
So, so with all of that, you know, thank you guys for listening to the podcast today. If you think it's helpful, please share it with a friend and keep on keeping on. And we'll see you next time on this journey. 